Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Oh, really? Do you have a problem with that? What did I just tell you? I wished you to have a happy, holy day. And of all the days in the year, I can think of only one that would be more holy than the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Only one. Possibly two. And that would be the day that we celebrate his death and the day we celebrate his resurrection. You see, his birth represents one of the holiest acts ever committed. God sent his son. God chose to take on himself human flesh and come down to earth and take the form of a servant and humble himself to death, even death on a cross. Now, you know, I understand a lot of people get offended because it's not Merry Christmas. And I've been, the world comes to me and they go, oh, we don't do Merry Christmas, we do Happy Holidays. Great. Because the ignorance you display by not saying Merry Christmas, you perpetrate and you continue on by saying Happy Holidays. <laughs> Merry Happy Holidays Christmas. <laughs> it is a holy day and we celebrate it. So I don't get offended. I, I kind of think it's funny. Oh, well, we, we do Happy Holidays. We don't do Merry Christmas. Great. I'm good with that. I, I think it is a holy day. So, Merry Christmas. Happy <clears throat> holy day. Happy holidays. No, oh, you guys are lame. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on. <laughs> we're going to continue uh, in our series, Fruit of a Life Led by the Spirit. And we're actually in the midst of a message that I started uh, several weeks ago. Uh, just to kind of catch everybody up, I'm going to, we're reading out of Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Thankfully, Paul is just writing to the Galatians, so we don't have to worry about doing any of this. Thank you for that. Because you see, all Scripture is God-breathed. Right? All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for what? Yeah, teaching, correcting, rebuking, training us in righteousness. So, don't let the titles fool you. Okay? Don't, don't let that cause you any stumbling block. When it says Galatians, it's talking to you. Okay? It's speaking to me. When it says Titus, we still pay attention. Okay? God is speaking through these to us. So, Galatians chapter 5 Verse 16, knowing that God is speaking to us through the writings of Paul, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, and he makes a list. This is not a comprehensive list. It's an exemplary list. He's giving us examples of what a life led by the flesh looks like. And then jumping down to verse 22, he picks up with a list of what a life led by the Spirit should look like. These are the characteristics that are in opposition to the previous list. Okay? So in verse 22 we pick up, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, 
peace, patience, <coughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So, Paul is basically contrasting two very opposite things here. And we're not going to get caught up in the contrast, because what we really want to focus on, what I really feel like God wants us to pay attention to, is what our lives should look like. Now, two things I want to say to you. They're going to seem kind of contradictory. First, whose fruit is this? It's the Holy Spirit's fruit, right? Okay, so if the Holy Spirit is in you, these are the things that should be coming out of you. Okay? So it's not something that you have to go, I, I got to have joy today. That joy should be a natural outgrowth of God's Spirit living in you. Okay? But, and here's where it seems contradictory. Paul directs us to walk according to the Spirit. So that means there is a part that we, we still have to do. Now, what do you have to do? We walk. We walk according to the Spirit. Now see, every day, actually when we get down to it, every moment, <laughs> you are presented with two choices. In its simplest form, two choices. You can walk according to your spirit, or you can walk according to your flesh. You still have the ability to walk according to your flesh. Sometimes I think we're grave dwellers. Because see, the old man has been crucified and no longer lives. He's gone. He's dead. He's buried. But I think sometimes... We're so used to that old man that we camp out beside his grave so we can still be friends. And we're afraid to move away from that grave because that's what we know. When somebody does something to you, you react off of what you know. And this is why Paul is saying, walk, notice it is an active verb, not a passive one, it's meaning there's action. Meaning there is something that you are doing. Walk. Don't just sit there and go, I'm going to let God do this. Yeah, God is going to do that. But God has laid before you not only the ability, but the mandate to choose which you will walk according to. Okay? So, first, it's His Spirit that births this fruit in you. Okay? If you've been sealed with His Spirit, if His Spirit is living in you, this is what you should look like. Two, you have a choice whether to let that fruit grow or not. Okay? You have a choice every moment to decide, am I going to act in love? Or am I going to act in rage? Am I going to act in peace or fits of anger? Am I going to act in self-control or lust of the flesh? Every moment you have the opportunity to choose. Now, here's the thing. Don't get caught up because this isn't about your abilities. Okay? Here's where our hope lies. We make the choice. He gives us everything we need to live that choice out. Okay? It's His Spirit that enables us to accomplish this purpose. Okay? So all you really have to do is say, no, I'm going to do this. And God goes, yes! And He helps you to do it. Now, are, do we do it perfectly? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Sometimes I make choices according to my flesh, and I'm not even aware I've done it. Till later, when I realize what a train wreck I've made. And then I go, okay, all right, 
God is the master of the retest. Okay? Thank God for that. Because when you fail it, he picks you back up, sets you on your feet, brushes you off and says, let's try it again. Let's do it again. So we have talked about love and joy and peace, which I think is ironic considering the season we're in. The Christmas season. Isn't this the season where we're supposed to see love, joy, and peace? Did you guys watch Black Friday? <laughs> there was love, joy, and peace in my house because we weren't there. I was, I was still eating Thanksgiving stuff. <laughs> and more. Love, joy, and peace. Now, if you look on the, the front of your bulletin, there's a scripture that I put on there. Oops. It's out of Isaiah. It's one of the prophecies speaking of the coming Messiah. And it gives us a list of names, a list of titles that he will have. It says, Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Now I want you to hold on to that thought because that's a very significant title that we need to understand. Okay? So keep this somewhere where you can see it because we're going to refer back to the Prince of Peace. So a couple weeks ago, we were talking about peace, and I gave you some definitions about what peace is. And, and it really is pointless, because the peace that we're talking about, the world doesn't understand, and the world can't give. <coughs> so when we're looking for a definition, we need to go to what God says peace is, not what the world says peace is. Okay? Because the world says peace is absence of strife. Mm. If that's the case, I've never had peace in my life. <laughs> okay? Because everywhere I look, I see strife. And I know after talking with a lot of you, there's a lot of strife in this life, isn't there? There's just a lot of stuff that happens. And if we go according to the world's definition of peace, we're in trouble. Flip with me if you would. I've got a better example of peace. Uh, flip with me if you would to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, I'm going to pick up in verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and sea obeyed him? Now flip with me, if you would, over to Mark chapter 4. And this is one of those stories that is told in a couple of the different Gospels. But there's a, a key difference here that I want you to pick up. We're starting in verse 35. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in a boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose... And the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. 
But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now there's a couple things that I want to point out in these stories. First, I believe God is giving us a perfect example of what peace looks like. Because the disciples are in the boat and they're headed across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus lays down in the back on a cushion and goes to sleep. And the winds come up, the waves are ginormous, they're swamping the boat, okay? And, and you got to wonder, you know, we know several of these men were fishermen, and those are the guys that are pr probably trying to steer the boat and keep it floating, and poor guys like Matthew, the tax collector, are using cups and bailing water because they don't trust him with an oar. And these are men, keep in mind, a lot of whom grew up on that sea. Do you see what it says? They were despairing of their lives. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Did Jesus care? Yeah. Do you think Jesus cared? Yeah. yeah. Do you think Jesus thought they were perishing? No. no. But Jesus wasn't phased. Now, I don't know about you guys. Some of you guys have been on boats a whole lot more than I have. But, um, you know, big waves, I'm not, man, on the size of the boat that they're on, I couldn't sleep. You bounce. <laughs> and Jesus was sacked out in the back. A perfect example of peace because the storm was raging all around them. And not only was the storm raging all around them, but all the people with him were panicked. What do we do? What do we do? Go wake the master. Now, how'd you like to be that disciple? You still have so little faith? He always wakes up cranky. Every time we wake him up, he chews us out. I know, they, they delegated Peter for this, but he was used to it. Wake him up. Wake him up. And he gets up and he rebukes the wind and the storm and there was a great calm. There's peace again. But you see where the peace emanated from? Could they have calmed the storm? Maybe. I think it was an object lesson. I think Jesus was using that as an object lesson to teach them to trust God. To have faith. To build their faith. He wasn't showboating. I think he was expecting one of them to take care of it. I, I really do. I think Jesus was in full expectation that one of them would try and step up. Just like Peter getting out of the boat and walking on the water. I think that was his hope. And he gets up and rebukes, and there's great calm. But do you see where the peace emanates from? First, he's asleep. He has peace. It is within him. And then the peace that he has, he uses the authority that God gave, and he calms everything around him. Isn't that a marvelous picture of peace? Isn't that incredible? So, so how do we get this peace? <clears throat> now, we've talked about a couple of things. First... The world cannot give it to you. So turn off Oprah. She doesn't have it. She can't give it. Okay? Quit looking in self-help books. Quit looking on your talk shows. Quit looking in your meditation and your trance-like states. 
You can only find it one place. And that's in him. That's it. That's the only kind, the only place that you can find this kind of peace. Okay? Isaiah writes in chapter 26. You don't have to turn there. Isaiah writes in chapter 26. He says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And it would be awesome. Just that right there is awesome. That's a promise. If you keep your mind in God, you will have perfect peace. I know this from experience because when my mind gets off of God, I have no peace. Everything bothers me. I have an entire zoo of pet peeves. <laughs> and they come in all sizes and shapes. But when I keep my mind in Christ, when I keep my thoughts set on God, I have peace. And those pet peeves, they don't bother me. They don't bother me. Except for mouth noises. Mouth noises still bother me. I'm working through that one. Pray for me. <laughs> But he doesn't end there. He says, trust in the Lord forever. Why? Why should we trust in the Lord? He says, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Now, depending on how you grew up and what you think, a rock could be a negative term. My brother, he used to call me a rock. And that was not complimentary. He <laughs> was referring to my lack of ability to figure things out that he could which happened twice. Okay, maybe more than that. And he'd go, man, you're a rock. Okay, that was not, he was not telling me, like, good things. It was bad things. That's not what this is talking about. Matter of fact, the rock that he's talking about, uh, in one example, in the Psalms, it says that it's a rock in the desert where you will find shade. In the New Testament, it tells us that it's the firm foundation that the storm will not be able to wipe away from us. The same idea is carried through when it says that God is our refuge, our fortress, our high tower. That's the idea of the rock. An everlasting rock. It cannot be changed. It cannot be altered. It cannot be broken. Why do we put our trust in him? Because he is Faithful and constant for all eternity. He will not change. Okay? So, you keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Why do we trust in him? We trust in him forever because the Lord is an everlasting rock. How about we trust that what God has said will come to pass? Do you believe that what God has said will happen? Do you believe that? Okay. But see, if you don't believe that, you're in for a world of hurt because you will never have the peace. You're going to struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle because the only thing you have if you don't believe that he's faithful to his promises is your own strength. John 16.33 Jesus is speaking, he says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, I, I get really frustrated with this idea that you become a Christian and life is a, a bed of roses. Uh -huh. That's not what he said. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, if you become one of his disciples, the world is going to hate you like it hated him. Okay? And he says it's going to be hard. Matter of fact, we're told to expect persecution, to expect trials, 
to expect tribulation. Some of them because the world hates us. Some of them because God loves us. Do you understand that? Some of the hardship you go through is because God loves you? What are you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that God does not want you to stay an infant for the rest of your life. God wants you to grow up, to be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Not lacking anything. He wants you to have it all. So he lets trials come into your life. Now, what's the difference between a trial and a temptation? You. Your success or failure. I'm convinced of that. I earnestly believe that the only difference between a trial and a temptation is how you respond to it and whether or not you succeed. Now keep in mind, you always succeed because God is the master of the retest. You fail this time, he's going to bring it around again and again and again and again until you pass it. And then guess what? You graduate to the next test. Okay? And each test is going to bring you more and more maturity and more and more completeness because you're going to rely more and more on him to take you through it. You want peace? Have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. Don't just know about him. Know him. Be known by him. I can tell you a lot of things about a lot of people just because I know about them. I can tell you a lot of things about President Obama, but I don't know him. As far as I know, he doesn't know me. <laughs> One of these days he may show up for dinner. I don't know. I'm not expecting it. Have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. Says in Ephesians chapter 2, says, For he himself is our peace. He himself is our peace. Jesus. You get that? That's, that's the peace that the world can't understand. It's him. Do you ever think about studying God's word so that you might have peace? Do you ever think about that? Do you know that's a way that you can get peace? See, all of these things work together. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But studying God's word. In uh, Psalm 119. How many of you like Psalm 119? I like Psalm 119. Because I understand the law. The law to me is easy. You do this, you don't do this. Great! It's when he says, you got to move according to his spirit that I go, could you put that in black and white? Okay? And I, I struggle with that because there's a lot of it that changes from situation to situation because God will have me act this way in this situation and act this way in this situation. And I look at both situations and man, if I had the law, I'd know exactly what to do. Psalm 119 says, Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Now, I honestly, I believe that when the author penned this, he was saying the law as in the Torah, the original five books, but I believe God's intent is the perfect law that gives freedom, not the law that brings death. Okay? So, I'm not telling you to go back and memorize the first five books of the Bible. I'm not telling you to love the law that leads to death. I'm telling you to love the law that leads to life. You're not sure what I'm talking about? Take a little bit of time, read through Romans and Galatians. 
okay? Take a little bit of time and find out what the difference between those two laws is, okay? There's two more things I want to cover here. God has given us a very simple formula, if you will, for lack of a better term, to how to get peace. Now, the first thing we need to understand is that the peace that we're talking about, the fruit of the Spirit, comes by His Spirit living in us. That's the part that He's given us. But there's the part that we're responsible to do, the part that is dependent on us, the choice we get to make to walk according to that Spirit by spending time with Him, by spending time in His Word, by doing this in Philippians chapter 4. You guys have probably heard this. You'll remember this because it's one of my favorite passages. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Okay, see, this is our part. Don't be anxious. Now, I know some of you have a really easy time not being anxious. I don't understand it, but I see it. And I bless you people sometimes. Sometimes I want to shake you. But God has blessed you with something. Okay? I tend to look at things, and, and they bother me. Okay? And I go, okay, A plus B equals C, and I know I don't like C. C is always bad for me. So can we change either A or B so we can get somewhere else? And I see A and B coming up, and Christy goes, sweetie, those may never happen. There's a potential A and a possible B. But I'm convinced there's a definite C. And, and what if? See, what if is the favorite prelude to a warrior's sentence. What if this? What if President Obama were to show up at my house for dinner? I don't know what you feed a president. What is he like? I don't, now I've got to study. Christy, we've got to have this on hand in case he shows up. What is he like? Some of you could probably tell me, huh? Don't be anxious, but he doesn't leave it there. He doesn't just tell us to take something away. He tells us to replace it with something. Okay? And he says, in everything, okay, so what are we supposed to be anxious about? Nothing. nothing. There's nothing that we have been given permission to be anxious about. Okay? Everything is off the table. So right now, there's a clean slate. So let's, let's put on that slate what God tells us to put on that slate. He says, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, does that mean that all of our situations are off the table? No, the situations are still there. We've got to deal with them. We have stuff in this life we just have to deal with. We have family members that do the darndest things. And, and we've got to deal with it. We don't just wipe it off the table and, and live our life in oblivion. Or in our family, we call it obliviosity. There's a magical world called obliviosity. I do not have a past to that world. So the situation is still on the table, but how we deal with it is right here. He says, in everything, so what does that include? Everything, so everything back on the table here. Worry is gone, that's been taken off. Everything is still on the table with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. One of the things that I really, God has laid on my heart years ago is that I do not pray without thanking Him. I don't pray without thanking Him because I have much, much, much to be thankful for. <clears throat> And when I start thanking him for all the things that he's done for me, all of a 
sudden I realize all the, the, these other things, I can trust him with those. <coughs> Let your request be made known to God. Now, look, you know, some of us have this idea that we're kind of holy and righteous if we just go, oh, I'm not going to bring that to God. That's foolishness. He already knows. He knows everything. You're not hiding anything. He says right here, what do we bring to him? Everything. everything. So what is it okay for you to keep back? Nothing. Nothing. So we bring everything to him. Oh, that's not a big one. God doesn't care about that. Really? He numbers the hair on your head. That's how much he's into things. Okay? So everything, we make our requests known to God. Now, if we stop right there, we've had a problem. He's taken that away and he's given us a solution. But then there comes a promise. And the promise is what I want you to get. Okay? So first, quit worrying. Don't be anxious. There's nothing in this life that God wants you to be anxious about. Nothing. Everything in this life, God wants you to bring to him. Everything. And he wants you to do it with thanksgiving. I'm not talking about that one day a year with turkey and football. I'm talking about a life that every day you are cognizant of the things that he has done and is doing for you. You're aware of who he is. And here's the promise. If you do this, God will do this. Okay? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which means you can't figure it out, and I can't figure it out, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I think Paul specifically used hearts and minds. I, I, I think he did that because he's talking about your emotions and your thoughts, your feelings and what you think. God will guard those in Christ Jesus. So when you're dealing with something that should cause you anxiety, God is going to guard your heart and your mind in that. And it's not going to cause you anxiety because you're going to have thanksgiving and he's going to give you peace. That's his promise. So we need to discipline ourselves to do this right. Now, how many here shoot archery? Okay, how many shoot guns? Oh, come on. Yeah. Now, how many shoot guns well? <laughs> I shoot guns lucky. How do you get to shoot a gun well? Practice. 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 You want peace? You have to practice the things that God has put in place for you to have that peace. And what is it? Giving everything to Him. Trusting Him and letting Him do it. All of these fruits come by spending time with Him. One last thing. Remember this, Prince of Peace? He is the Prince of Peace. John chapter 14. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn there, John chapter 14. Verse 27. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. 
Check out what he says right after that. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, the Prince of Peace, the one promise in Isaiah, he is the Prince of Peace. And that peace is what he gives us. That's his promise. And he is faithful to his promises. But God wants you to grow. He wants you to grow up. So he asks things of you. He requires things of you. And he says when things are hard and the, the, the waves are rising and the wind is blowing and it looks like you might be sinking. He says, give it to him. With thanksgiving. God, I thank you I got a boat. Or maybe a plank. Or that you've naturally endowed me with buoyancy. <laughs> you give thanks. And he promises you that his peace will be there. His peace. Not the world's peace. His peace. Amen? Amen? So let's meditate on that. Let's contemplate that. This season. This season of peace. That the world I hear all around us, oh, you know, it's a peaceful season, and da 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 da. Man, watch the news, people. Look at what the world has to offer for peace. Let's look at the one that is the author of peace, the, the, the prince of peace. That's his promise to us. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, that your spirit lives in us. Father, when you took Jesus home and he ascended to his rightful place at your right hand you did not leave us alone but you sent your spirit sealing us until redemption is complete marking us as your own teaching us, <coughs> instructing us comforting us and the natural outgrowth of this father are your fruits in our lives Agape love, <coughs> completely unconditional, based on the giver, not the receiver, based on you. Joy, just by spending time in your presence, we have joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. And peace that the world can neither give nor can the world understand. Thank you, Father, for these and all the others we've yet to look at. We bless you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.